In recent years, the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, has been exerting increasing pressure on Taiwan. The world is concerned that a war in the Taiwan Strait is coming. Whether or not the U.S. can come to Taiwan's aid promptly has become a vital issue. The day after Xi's speech was the 110th National Day for the Republic of China, or ROC, otherwise known as Taiwan. Since October 1st, CCP military jets have been conducting large-scale operations for four consecutive days to disturb Taiwan, totaling 149 transgressions into Taiwan's Southwest Air Defense Identification Zone. On the morning of October 10th, or the National Day for the ROC, CCP warplanes entered Taiwan's Southwest airspace again. From the pictures provided by Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense, there is only one jet so far. Concerning the communist aircraft disturbing Taiwan on its national day, people in Taiwan commented, Are they doing military parades on the wrong side of the border, or are they here to celebrate? Taiwan held a grand ceremony to celebrate on October 10th. We will not act rashly, but there should be absolutely no illusions that the Taiwanese people will bow to pressure we will continue to bolster our national defense and demonstrate our determination to defend ourselves in order to ensure that nobody can force Taiwan to take the path China has laid out for us. Because the path that China has laid out offers neither a free and democratic way of life for Taiwan, nor sovereignty for our 23 million people. Taiwan's National Day theme is a democratic alliance making friends around the world. It highlights the two critical elements of Taiwan's global foothold, namely Taiwan's insistence on forming an alliance with U.S.-led democratic countries and on winning the hearts and minds of people around the world. The more we achieve, the greater the pressure we face from China. So I want to remind all my fellow citizens that we do not have the privilege of letting down our guard. The international politics of this moment are facing a radical change the rise of autocratic systems has made countries that support freedom and democracy alert, while Taiwan is standing on the front line of defending democracy. On the one hand, the U.S. is trying to keep a deterrent effect on the CCP. On October 7th, the Wall Street Journal reported that the U.S. military had been secretly stationed in Taiwan for at least a year. A regularly updated Pentagon document shows that as of June 30th, 2021, the U.S. military still has 23 Marines, 2 Navy, and 5 Air Force personnel based in Taiwan. The Economist further noted the next day that about 3,500 to 4,000 Pentagon officials visit Taiwan each year. Major media outlets also pointed out that the U.S. military presence in Taiwan has been no secret and the CCP is believed to have had the information for many years. So, it's of unusual significance to publicize it at such time. It may be an implication that U.S. military personnel are already in Taiwan and that an attack on Taiwan by force would mean a direct conflict with U.S. forces. The CCP has drawn a red line with the U.S., prohibiting U.S. military aircraft from entering Taiwan without the CCP's permission. However, since June 2021, this red line has been crossed three times. On June 6, three members of the U.S. Senate arrived at Taiwan's Songshan Airport on a Boeing C-17 cargo plane with the letters U.S. Air Force on its body. Former President Trump has sold arms to Taiwan 11 times during his presidency, worth 18.3 billion U.S. dollars. On August 4, the U.S. State Department approved the sale of 40 sets of medium self-propelled howitzer systems and related equipment to Taiwan with a total worth of 750 million U.S. dollars. This is the first arms sale to Taiwan by the Biden administration. I think that Taiwan, maybe, can be attacked at any time, because we are a small island nation. We are like a bargaining chip in negotiations between big countries. I don't know when there will be a war, but I think it is very likely to happen. 
If it really comes to this, we will have to see what country has more resources and is more willing to support us in the end. It seems clear that Biden has other concerns. Both Biden and Xi appear to be full of political calculations. Xi has a dream of a unified China with Taiwan, while Biden has a vision of climate. The Biden administration likely expects the U.S.-China relationship to be moving back to so-called bilateral cooperation. On September 10, 2021, Biden initiated a phone call with Xi and released Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou. Beijing is well aware of what the Biden administration wants. When Biden first moved into the White House, he created a special position for climate issues. The CCP uses CO2 emissions reduction as leverage to force Biden to make significant concessions on trade and economic issues. In early September 2021, climate envoy Kerry went to China for the second time to discuss this issue. On September 11th, China issued a document titled, Improving the Dual Control Measures on Energy Consumption Intensity and Total Amount. This document shows that Beijing is prepared to use forced power cuts to reduce thermal power generation at the expense of the economy and corporate interests to reach the goal of CO2 emission reduction. The date of the document implies that after Kerry returned to the U.S. and before the call between Biden and Xi, the CCP already knew that Biden would make concessions on economic and trade issues, so it had been preparing the document as a return gift. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal on September 24th, the U.S. Commerce Secretary said she would seek to improve business relations with China and plan to lead a delegation to China. On October 1st, when the CCP celebrated the establishment of its regime in China, Blinken expressed his greetings to Beijing for the occasion. Three days later, that is, October 4th, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai delivered a speech on the Biden administration's trade policy with China that had been long awaited. In her speech, she introduced new expressions such as recoupling and durable coexistence. It has drawn widespread attention and is interpreted as a positive signal from the Biden administration to Beijing. A quick-acting Catherine Tai got on the phone with the Chinese vice premier on October 8th and began discussing how the U.S. could use cosmetic excuses to restore the situation to what it was before the Communist Party was hit with tariff sanctions. Now the challenge for the Biden administration is that the CCP has stepped up its military threat to Taiwan. Beijing has tied U.S. economic and trade policy toward China to military issues. On October 6th, Biden sent National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan to Switzerland to talk with the Communist Party's top diplomat for six hours, a large part of which was devoted to military confrontation. Any comments for China, China's provocation over Taiwan? Well, China has, I've spoken with Xi about Taiwan. We agree, we will abide by the Taiwan Agreement, that's where we are, and we made it clear that I don't think he should be doing anything other than abiding by the agreement. An encouraging sign is that increasing pressure from the CCP on Taiwan is pushing more countries and people to Taiwan's side, allowing the world to see it and making it attractive. The new Japanese prime minister said during his election campaign that if elected, countering China would be his top priority and that Taiwan was an essential partner for Japan. The Financial Times quoted Japanese military officials who wished to remain anonymous as saying that the U.S. and Japan have been conducting training and joint military exercises out of concern for a possible conflict with the CCP over Taiwan. Japan is the rotating chair of the CPTPP, or the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, and is the most influential country inside the organization. After the CCP and Taiwan filed their respective applications to join CPTPP, Japan publicly supported Taiwan's membership. On July 20th, Lithuania announced that it had agreed to establish a Taiwan representative office in Vilnius. This will be the first representative office in Europe to be named after Taiwan. The announcement sparked strong objections from the CCP and threatened to withdraw its ambassador. However, the Lithuanian president said that he would not back down. On September 1st, the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament took three measures to support Lithuania. First, it proposed to rename the EU Economic and Trade Office in Taipei as EU Office in Taiwan. 
Second, it passed the EU-Taiwan Political Relations and Cooperation Report with a high vote to comprehensively enhance relations with Taiwan. And third, it adopted a proposal to support Lithuania. Over the past year or so, the CCP has taken many steps to retaliate against Australia for taking the lead in conducting an independent investigation into the origins of COVID-19. On May 6th, Australian Prime Minister Morrison said that Australia would fulfill its commitment to support the U.S. and its allies if the CCP invaded Taiwan by force. On September 17th, Australian Trade Minister said that Australia would oppose Beijing's participation in the CPTPP unless Beijing stopped imposing retaliatory tariffs on Australian imports and resumed ministerial-level contacts between the two sides. It is in large measure to try to help to end this isolation from which Taiwan has been suffering uh, for so many decades that I am here in this country and I do hope that uh, this will be the first of many visits. The remarks of a certain Australian politician are confusing black from white, confounding right and wrong, and extremely absurd. They are extremely immoral and irresponsible and will not win support from others. We urge certain people in Australia to abandon the Cold War mentality and ideological bias, respect basic facts, view China and its development in an objective and rational way, and stop making irresponsible remarks. Taiwan is basically qualified to join the CPTPP because of its high-tech achievements and the foundation of the rule of law as a democratic country, while the CCP has difficulty meeting the high threshold of the CPTPP at almost all levels because of its authoritarian system of party rule. Taiwan has a high chance of joining the CPTPP, but the CCP may not enter the door. If this happens, the international status of the two regimes will make an historic turn. On October 5th, the French Senate released a special report on the influence of countries outside Europe, exposing the CCP's use of Confucius Institutes to influence French universities and academia. It is yet another move by the French. On September 20th, the Institute for Strategic Studies of the French Military Academy released a heavyweight report entitled China's Influence in Action. On October 6th, former French Defense Minister and current Senate member Alain Richard insisted on leading a delegation to visit Taiwan despite strong objections and threats from the CCP. For us, members of parliament, uh, but in, in close discussion with our government, we consider our relationship with Taiwan as something which has to last, to be regular, and to be deep in content. So we have so many uh, spaces of cooperation and of exchanges, and I insist especially on the economic ground, because this country is a big power economically, and we appreciate so much its dynam dy dynamism. So in this approach to um, in the Indo-Pacific security, we want to be a contributor and we want to be helpful to maintain stability, open communications, free navigation. Aujourd'hui, nous avons une vraie difficulté dans le monde puisque les régimes autoritaires considèrent que les démocraties ne sont, sont à un système occidental et que ça n'est pas le bon système pour le développement humain, et qu'ils veulent imposer un système autoritaire. Et Taïwan est le contre-exemple. Taïwan se développe grâce à la démocratie et se développe très vite, et fait la démonstration inverse. At the Freediving World Championships held on September 28th, the organizers were pressured by the CCP to remove the flag of the Republic of China from the broadcast footage of the competition. Subsequently, teams from 10 countries, including Japan, the US, Russia, Croatia, the Netherlands, Australia, South Korea, France, Germany, and Slovenia, took the initiative to remove their national flags to show their solidarity and support for Taiwan. The 10 countries mentioned above include not only Taiwan's usual allies, but also Russia and South Korea, which are closer to the CCP. It shows that hearts and minds are turning toward Taiwan even in countries like Russia and South Korea. On September 30th, the International Association for the Development of Freediving, or AIDA, posted on its official website, 
we would like to apologize for the incident with the flag of Taiwan during the streaming of the AIDA World Championship. The stop of the stream by the Chinese authorities took us by surprise and the team was not prepared to deal with it on such short notice. But we learned from our mistakes and will set different streams from now on to prevent this from happening again. It's rare for AIDA to apologize to Taiwan publicly. It suggests that the hearts and minds of sports organizations like AIDA are turning toward Taiwan as well. Although we have been hearing the sound of the military planes recently, but I think the situation internationally is that many countries that are now trying to help Taiwan be acknowledged under its real name and so on. So I think it doesn't only depend on China if there will be a war just because China wants it in comparison to the discussion abroad. After the collapse of all the communist regimes in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, the CCP is the last major country in the world to have a communist party in power. Taiwan, on the other hand, is the beacon of freedom and democracy for the Chinese worldwide. Judging from the current trend, the more Beijing squeezes Taiwan, the more countries and more people will turn to support Taiwan.